Hey everyone, what it be? What it do? It's me, Yemi the Ferret here with another episode of Yemi Cast, a video game podcast on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Apple Music at all those places. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, it is... It's hot! <laughs> it's hot today. We literally just had like three days of like, oh yes, this is good weather. And now, the day that I go to record this, it's like, uh uh-uh, oven's back on, Satan's ass is coming in, and it's coming in hot. Ooh, smelly! That's a lot of damage! But what's up, everybody? It's me, Yemi the Ferret here, with another episode of YemiCast. And we're going to be talking about all things news today. That's right, news, 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 news. That's, that's what I'm seeing on my screen right now. How are you guys doing today? Uh, thank you for coming to the premiere, if you are here for the premiere, on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I appreciate you so much. The podcast is also available um, on other all other platforms the same day, so don't feel left out. If you're not here for the premiere, because I appreciate you no matter what. This Sunday, I don't know if there's going to be a podcast episode this Sunday, seeing as I'm helping my parents move houses. But I definitely know that Saturday is not going to be a live stream. There's not going to be a live stream Saturday, but there might possibly be a podcast Sunday if I get it done on time. But that's debatable. But usually the podcast is also premiere at 9.30 a.m. on Sundays as well. So... If you want to, you can check back for that. Uh, I'll post on Twitter if it's coming or not on Saturday. I should know by then. Uh, But yeah, thank you all for coming. Let's jump right into it today because we got big news today. We got all these news articles are boom, 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 big, huge, massive. But let's let's start off with uh, this first one that I found the most interesting because ukulele is a game that has a little bit of controversy around it, especially with myself personally. Uh, it boasted it was going to be the rare revival you were looking for, and it was going to be a collectathon, and blah 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 blah, in the same vein as Banjo Kazooie. And you and I hear the word Banjo Kazooie, and I'm like, what? <laughs> so, you know, you know, my head twisted around. Um, did a 360 and looked at this Kickstarter when it originally came out. The Kickstarter for Ukulele, which was made by Playtonic Games, which is a bunch of ex-Rare staff, the people who didn't go on to join the the Microsoft crew to work on Banjo-Kazooie, Nuts and Bolts, uh, they started Playtonic Games, and they raised over $2 million for Ukulele, and I was a part of that. I, I, I pitched in about, I think I pitched in $10 for the game? It was 5 or 10 uh, the, whichever one. Uh, and I remember being really excited for this, uh, pre-ordering it, et cetera, et cetera. I picked it up from GameStop, and I put it in, and the first level was like, oh, wow, this is really cool, and, you know, the, you can spend pages to get even more of a level. And I 100%ed the first level, and I went to the next one, and I was like, well, this doesn't feel finished, and I went to the next one, and I was like, this doesn't feel finished, and I went to the next one, and this doesn't feel finished. The hub world is so confusing and spread out, and there's no, like, there's, I don't know, it's just so weird. It's just a very strange game to me. Each level has a theme, but it reuses the same characters from, like, the past levels, and it's like, I don't understand what's going on. There's a giant fridge talking to me, and there's a freaking (laughs) signpost talking to me. This this doesn't make any sense. And that's what you're saying. Uh, But to Yemi, the original game had a bunch of random things talking to you. That is true. But it had more of a theme for each level. A sphinx talked to you. Uh, you know, a cactus talked to you. You know, it was a camel talked to you. It's all in the same vein in Banjo-Kazooie. But in this game, there's a level, and it's Halloween-themed, and there's four different shopping carts that talk to you. And that's just, like, that's where I draw the line. The boss fights were okay in this game, but I just I didn't really like anything about the game. I thought the game was a shell of what it could have been. And... I don't know. It, it was a little. It was a bit of a letdown for me, and I haven't played it since. I have it for PS4, and it's just been sitting on my shelf since I got to the last level. Uh, pretty much, what you can do is you can 100% the first two levels, and then you have enough pages for the rest of the game practically. So I just unlocked all the worlds and explored a little bit, and said, "Okay, yeah, I've seen it all. I can see." Um, but don't let me uh, take away your fun from Ukulele. I mean, there's still aspects about this game that are fine that I enjoy. And this interview with Platonic 
kind of tells a little bit more of the story behind the scenes. They knew that there was going to be some issues with the game. They don't really go, go into depth with it, but they do say, they do admit to, yeah, there's a few trials and errors that we couldn't sort out. But they were talking with MCV in an interview with MCV, the Platonic co-founder Chris Sutherland, the technical art director Mark Stevenson, and the designer Hamish Lockwood discussed the various challenges and issues that co cropped up during the production and addressed specific criticisms of the game. And uh, they started with the camera. They knew the camera is going to rub people the wrong way. And he and Sutherland has this to say on the subject. Where it didn't work so well, maybe, was the camera, because we were trying to bring back the style of the camera that we had when the f when those first 3D games were coming out. The camera tended to take the approach of trying to sort things out for you, and trying to position themselves in intelligent places. So we went along that route, because that way the camera frames the player, and um, is part of the feel of these games. But the way that it works means it could actually end up disorienting the player, and I think that's something that we realized maybe slightly later on. We addressed it in a patch where we intrude, introduced different camera positions so people could take control, and uh, people now do with most 3D environments. If we were going back and redoing it all over again, we would probably start off with the camera uh, options in there. You see, this doesn't make sense to me because the camera in Banjo-Kazooie was pretty on point through most of the game. I I mean, I'm not just saying this because I love Banjo-Kazooie and it's my favorite game of all time. I'm saying this because when I went through Banjo-Kazooie th uh, this year, I 100%ed it again, I hardly had any problems with the camera. Only in the tight spaces, like in Clanker's Cavern, when you're going below Clanker, you go into that small space. Sometimes when, it go when it's going from, you know, the wide open seawater, not seawater, but water, to the de deep depths area where you you know, turn the key, sometimes the camera can flake out a little bit, or when you're going through a tight passageway as the pumpkin in the Halloween part. But for the most part, I feel like the camera was really good in Banjo-Kazooie. And then when you get to ukulele, it's it's got those fixed positions sometimes, but other times, like, you're in a tight space and it won't move at all, and then, I, I don't know, it's hard to describe. I need to go back and play it, of course, with all the updates to the game, just so I have an updated perspective of the game. And I'm, I'm probably going to do a, um, a revisit next, of ukulele it's one of those games that i've had on the shelf for a while i kind of want to get back into probably i'll you know maybe during a sale or something I'll, I'll buy it on steam just so i don't have to lug the playstation all the way upstairs just to just to play it um but anyways that that's that's my thoughts on the camera as from what he said and then the team was more surprised to find that the trademark garbled voice work was a cause of irritation so he continued to say, it was interesting because it's something that back in the 1990s was probably amusing to people, and it didn't irritate them so much. Or maybe it's just because there wasn't the internet back then, so people couldn't tell us how much they hated it. It was, again, something that we addressed in the patch. It was interesting because some people said, oh, it's great because it recites the original feel. And that's one of the things we were going for. But at the same time, we didn't want to wind, wind people up either. So we had an option in the update that followed to allow for more restrained form of the voices than one we shipped with. I didn't have a problem with the gargle voices. I thought the gargle voices were fine. Um, I always loved the voices from Banjo, Kazooie, and Tui. And uh, even Nuts and Bolts kind of had, had it in there. And I thought it was fine in ukulele. I didn't really mind it that much. I just, the same problem comes back over and over again. I, I wish that the characters were better designed and I wish that they actually matched the levels. There's several levels where you, you ride a minecart. It's the same minecart. There's several levels where you talk to a signpost and it's the same signpost over all those levels. I feel like they didn't, they didn't express these levels as well as they would have in the Banjo-Kazooie 2 game. Anyways, designer Lockwood said he agreed with many of the criticisms. A lot of the criticisms we probably expected and were aware of from the day it came out. We all knew where the issues were, mostly because we didn't have a lot of time to do everything that we wanted and how we wanted. So a lot of criticism people had were pro we probably agree with. I think one thing, the only things that did surprise me were the voices because I was playing it and I was like, yeah, this is fine. It's just what we used to be. And that's kind of the point of the game. So the voice thing for me was a surprise, but a lot of other criticisms I just accepted and that's fine. It was a tough project, I think. Here's the deal. Just delay the game. <laughs> You don't, like, developers need to learn you don't need to put out an unfinished game. Like, I don't care how much hype is around the game, you you can pull it back a little bit and people won't get too angry. I know, I know it's kind of a bad example, but pushing back um, Animal Crossing, the newest Animal Crossing, 
a lot of people are like really angry about it but i'm sitting here going if you want the game to be good wait a little bit longer it's not going to take years uh well you never know actually because duke nukem the du the duke nukem game took s several years um but normally around now it's like in a few months, they usually have updates out for, like, Fallout 76 and No Man's Sky and even Ukulele. They have updates out that pretty much make the game up to par with what it should have been when the game came out. Uh, some developers are taking longer than, than others, like Division 2 and stuff like that, but that's a conversation for later. Wink, wink. Um, so, right now, they do agree with most of the criticism, and I don't know if they agree with what I say, uh, but I definitely agree with a lot of things they said here. But it's weird that they would go into it knowing what was wrong with it and just being like, yeah, you know what, we'll, we'll release it anyways and take the flack. I don't know. That doesn't seem like a good business practice. Uh, they also went on to caution other developers considering Kickstarters due to the non-game related co commitments inherit from crowdfunding. So Stevenson said this, there's a lot of other things work-wise, like having to provide regular updates to the community and all the rewards that we had to produce in-house, like booklets, posters, t-shirts. I had to produce artwork ready for print, something I'd never done before in my life. But, you see, this is what you sign up for when you do a Kickstarter, because you know what you're telling people that they're going to get with the different tiers, and you know people are going to support the project. Maybe they won't support the, you know, $100,000 one, whatever, I don't even think there was one of those, but, you know, maybe people won't support that far ahead. But you need to know people are willing to spend up to a regular price of a game to get special perks. But, you know, whatever. He also went on and said, there were days where we would all go to these rooms and sort out all the t-shirts because they had to be in groups of large, small, or whatever. That was a time where I could have been working on the game! They're making a lot of excuses here that I don't agree with. Yeah, y you have t-shirts that need to be sent out. Hire one person to come in for a few hours a day and sort out the damn t-shirts. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Have a family member come in and be like, hey, we need just need we just need a little bit of help. Have your kids come in. Who knows? Whatever. Anyways, finally, Lockwood spoke of the necessary the necessity, I'm sorry, the necessity to keep promised features that might have been jettisoned had the development not been tied to the promises of the Kickstarter. For example, we did bosses and minecart sections as well as arcade games. All these extra things where if we hadn't made any of these promises, we would say, you know what, this isn't really working so well, and we'll just ditch it and spend more time on the core areas of the game. Stevenson agreed and said this, that's one of the worst aspects. You have to to promise stuff up front and then you're kind of committed to it for better or worse with games it's inherent difficulty that what sounds great on paper may not work that well in practice and oftentimes things have been ir 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 things have have to be ir iterated on again and again or even just scrapped i feel like you show people some gameplay of the minecart and be like it's not working out guys i'm sure that that could have been replaced with something else the 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 N64 Retro Rex Rex Rextro could have been redone a little bit. I mean, the, those games weren't fun. They were all very, very basic. Nothing too amazing there. I don't know. I don't know. Um, th they're doing this interview to um, talk about the uh, ukulele and the Impossible Lair, which is the next game coming out. It's supposed to be kind of like uh, Donkey Kong Country, or a, it's just going to be a 2D side-scroller game, pretty much. And uh, that's going to be what they're working on in the future at Playtonic. We'll see if uh, it's any better than Ukulele, the original game. Uh, maybe because there's not going to be as many camera positions and, and stuff like that. Characters, maybe they'll be able to kind of get a better handle on what they want in the game. But, you know, we got to wait and see. Um, I, like I said, I'm just, I, I was never impressed with Ukulele. And the statements that they say here just make me a little bit more angry. <laughs> because... There's so many things that they like, oh, the t-shirts, blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude, you signed up for this. You could have easily used some of the extra funds from the Kickstarter to hire on someone to come in and help with the merchandising, help with this, help with that. There's, there was there was so much extra room in the budget for doing a bunch of things. But, you know, and with it all being public, too, like, I know how much money they wanted and how much they got. I think they wanted, like, 750000 and they ended up getting, like, $2 million. So it's like... Where'd the money go? <laughs> Where did the money go, you motherfuckers? Boo! You stink! Moving on to something else that is more of a stink. Um, and actually, we have three stinks here. No Man's Sky, Anthem, and Fallout 76. But 
the, the director of Sean Murray is giving advice to Anthem in Fallout 76. He says, listen up, ladies. <laughs> uh, no Man's Sky came out a while ago and was n- nothing. It, w- it was just, it, it was, it was, it was crazy. Like the, the controversy around it was so monumental. People bought the game and then in droves hated on it because there was just things missing from it. There was unfinished aspects of the game. There was stuff that just people didn't understand. There was no multiplayer. The special editions of the game had a sticker over the label, over the ERC, ESRB rating um, because they took out the online, apparently. And they, of course, have updated it since 2016, and people have thanked them, and they, it's a complete game now. But before, it was in the same realm as Anthem and Fallout 76. And really, Anthem and Fallout 76, I feel like Anthem's a little bit worse off than Fallout 76 in terms of, like, people hating on the game, but I think the games are a little bit equal on the side of things that's like, is it finished? Is it good? Is it worth playing? But anyways, uh, Murray came out and said, uh, we went about two years without talking to the press at all, and we went about three months without saying anything to the community either. That was really hard. I sat down so many times and wrote the perfect blog post that was going to explain everything about the game development and the roadmap going ahead, but I could see that it didn't hold credibility with regards to where we were at, Murray explained, and that was during a recent panel at Develop 2019. He also continued to say, There have been a number of games that have since come out, had a polarizing launch, and that explosive mix of loads of people playing it, but also having problems with the games. And I can see EA, Microsoft, or Bethesda try to placate players by just talking to them, but for right or wrong... It does. It just doesn't really work. You see this all this this all the time. Wait, you see this all the time when a big publisher will talk to a community and try to solve the problem and then get embroiled, taking up more and more of its headspace. In other words, Murray says that everyone's out for blood, so you best shut up, nut up, and get to work. <laughs> Talking about features when a game's already out isn't the credi- isn't that credible or interesting, Murray told GamesRadar. Your actions are so much more important than what you have to say. It's quite a quote, and I think this can resonate with developers who are working on games that are have been released and they were broken and unfinished and people just complained out the wazoo about them. Uh, me personally, I haven't given Fallout 76 another chance, and I gave Anthem another chance because it's Bioware, and I said I love Bioware, but... I just, I can't get back into it. I don't know even, I don't even know why it's still on my shelf, to be honest with you. Like, every time I look at it, I go, yeah, I should probably sell that, you know, while it still has some value to it. But yeah, so this is interesting coming from the guy who worked on No Man's Sky. And I think they, I mean, he has some credibility here because they took a game that was broken and everyone hated at the beginning. Mostly everyone hated at the beginning. I shouldn't say everyone because there were still some lovers of the game. And they built it into something that actually works, something that people actually enjoy. Uh, it's it's the space opera that they always wanted. There's multiplayer now. There's land vehicles. There's craft, better crafting. There's better, There's just, everything has been improved about the game, I believe. And it's a game that I've said over and over again I don't want to get back into. But, you know, I'm, I'm tempted. I'm, of course, tempted. And I see people playing it. I see screenshots. I see all this stuff. And I go, you know, that'd be kind of cool. But I'll wait for a mega, mega, mega sale on Steam or something like that. Because I'm not just going to buy this game for a full price again. I, I, I've been burned too many times. Just remember Godzilla from freaking, um, uh, what was it, 2015? That Godzilla game? Whoo, boy, was that... That was, that was, that was awful, that Godzilla game. I, I don't even have a, I don't even have a freaking button to describe how, how much I hate that game. It was fucking disgusting. Ugh, V, that's disgusting, mate. All right, so Resident Evil 5, 6, and 4 are going to come to the Switch in October in a triple pack. Um, before it was announced that 5 and 6 were coming, and people didn't know that it was going to be bundled in with 4, but apparently 4 is getting a physical release with this triple pack. So all three games are going to be on, on the same cartridge, and it's going to be selling for about $60 for a bundle. I believe each game is about $30 individually, and they're not getting their own individual releases like on the PS4 or Xbox. <laughs> Uh, but that's going to be coming October 29th, the day before ha- All Hallows' Eve. Wow! Um, I believe that there is going to be multiplayer for 5 and 6, so you'll be able to play online with other people. 
team up with your friends. Uh, there's gonna so the the triple pack is North American exclusive. So if you're in the UK or the rest of Europe, you're not going to be getting this triple pack. So people who are collectors of physical editions that maybe uh, that may may want to get this game. Um, so we'll see if like the Resident Evil 2 remake or Resident Evil 7 comes to the game comes to the Switch eventually. I'm guessing that they're going to gauge how much or how many of these sell to determine if it's worth it to port them over. Who knows though. All right, so after months of rumors and leaks, Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD is going to launch on the Switch in October. This is the Wii game that came out, and it was just called Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz. I don't remember if the reviews were very good for it. I never played it personally myself, but it has been confirmed that this is the game that has been going up on boards and rating websites and getting getting put down because, uh, you know, people were like, hey, look at that. Um... It's not a new Super Monkey Ball game, but it is an HD remake of a game that probably didn't sell as well as they wanted it to. So, uh, it's going to be dropping the 29th of October, strangely enough, the same day as Resident Evil, <laughs> the trilogy, the triple pack. Um, and it's going to be about $40 at launch. And there are some details from the ex the official blog. So... Originally released on the Wii in 2006, Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD reinvigorates the original game with 100 single-player stages, 10 multiplayer minigames, revamped control schemes, updated graphics, and more. There's going to be online leaderboards for the first time in the series. Players can now compete with others around the world through online leaderboards for single-player, time attack, and all-new minigame de decathlon score attack modes. No monkey business. Play your way. Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD is going to be available on Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Steam with uniquely optimized control, sch control schemes for each platform. Everyone from first-time rollers to world record holders can jump right in and enjoy the fun. This comes after a few leaked images of the game coming out. Um, and yeah, it's been confirmed finally. Uh, Super Monkey Ball. I, I've never played a Super Monkey Ball game. Uh, it's been it's an it's a long running series if I remember correctly from Sega, and it used to I'm pretty sure it used to be just um I don't know if it was Nintendo exclusive or not I should probably say because I don't know much about the game but this is a c interesting development and hey maybe it'll bring some new Monkey Ball people around and maybe this will lead to a new game coming out who knows. All right, so Pokemon Go is going to team up with One Piece in a special crossover event later this month. So the Pokemon Company has announced uh, the event is going to be uh, from the 22nd of July through the 29th of July. A special Straw Hat Pikachu will appear in the game worldwide. Trainers will also be able to acquire their very own Straw Hat, just like the one that Monkey D. Luffy Whereas, if you happen to live in Japan, there will also be a One Piece statue located in Kumamoto, which doubles at a special Poke Stop and features art by the One Piece creator Iricho Oda. This statue is also to help support the, Kum the Kumamoto City rebuild after the earthquake at the start of the year and ties in with the Go's 3rd anniversary and 22nd anniversary of One Piece. This is pretty cool. We've never really seen One Piece and Pokemon do a collab like this, so I think that this is a good idea, and it's for a good cause as well. Interesting news. Once again, the DLC packs for Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 are not going to be sold individually. There will, be, there will only be an expansion pass that includes all three of the DLC packs. In a a uh, post by Ninten on, on Nintendo's official website, it stated the following. This paid expansion pass includes all three DLC packs, which will be uh, become available as they release one at a time after the launch of Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 The Black Order and will not be sold individually. There's also a new image on the Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 website reinforcing the fact that the DLC will not be sold uh, separately. So on this little post picture... It has Deadpool holding a, holding a taco. You know, he's got a chef hat and, a, and an apron on. And he's giving the thumbs up. And in the blurb it says, With the paid expansion pass, you'll get access to three exclusive DLC packs as they release one time after another after the game's launch. Packs will include story content and playable characters from popular franchises like Fantastic Four, X-Men, and Marvel Knights. And they will not be available for individual purchase. Bonus with purchase, you get an in-game alternative color chef outfit for Deadpool. Okay, so that's that's the image. This is kind of weird, because let's say there's a pack that comes out that has a bunch of X-Men characters, and you're like, well, I don't want that. But, oh, wait, yeah, it, but the next one has a bunch of characters that you do want from, like, Fantastic Four or something like that. 
you gotta buy the expansion packs. You can't just buy them for like five bucks each. That's um, that's interesting. I don't know if I like that. I mean, since the beginning of DLC, I think most of them have been separately sold. You know, the from Call of Duty all the way up to like Tetris 99. It's all individual stuff. There's uh, I don't know. This is a weird way to take this. A weird direction to go. Uh, they'll probably make more money with it, sure, in the long run, but, I mean, at what cost? <laughs> Doom Eternal's multiplayer is going to be as equally satisfying as the single-player campaign, says the developers. During an interview with VGC, Doom Eternal's creative director Hugo Martin said the game's multiplayer component would, would lead this time around rather than follow. Which is a little bit concerning to me. <laughs> Uh, with Doom 2016, we learned that ID has to lead and not follow when it comes to game design. With the single-player campaign, I think we led, but with the multiplayer, we followed. The fans and credits picked up on that. It's a good mode, and it's fun to play, but it's not necessarily original. Yeah, I felt like the Doom multiplayer from 2016 felt a lot like Halo. It was very Halo-esque, even though it had Doom guns and uh, Doom, you know, you could turn into a demon. I still felt like it, it felt very Halo-like. This time around, we really wanted to, it to feel like Doom. We took the DNA from the Doom dance of the loop of Slayer versus many demons, and we turned that into a competitive social experience. When we have one Slayer on the battlefield that lets and lets players control the demons, it felt really good. We'd rather provide players with an incredibly polished and engaging experience that's really tight than something that's huge with a million modes, which is another thing we did in Doom 2016. I think it's going to be every bit satisfying to play the single-player campaign. We will play it all the time internally, and it's really, really fantastic. Yeah, I like this idea a lot better. Having one person go up against a horde of of players and AI trying to kill the Doom Slayer. It, it's almost Gears of War-esque, um, so it's not incredibly original, because in Gears of War, there was a team of four people, and there was a team of four people on the other side, and you would try and hold out against the waves of enemies, which I thought was really, really fun, and, and that's always been the best game mode in any Gears of War experience. Um, and it feels like they're kind of taking that and modifying a little bit. Also, the executive producer Marty Stratton added to it, saying, With Doom 2016, we didn't give players a Slayer experience in multiplayer. We didn't give them the Doom experience that they got with the campaign, and that's really what it's all about. For players who came to Doom 2016 for the campaign, the multiplayer felt like a sidecar in comparison. Eternal is entirely what they want. We get analytics from our game, and we see how many people are still playing the Doom campaign. They play it again and again and again, and because it's like that the way that it makes them feel. So with Doom Eternal Battle Mode, we want to give players the ability to continue playing with a more with a in a more dynamic setting. Yeah, I mean the the numbers don't lie. I mean I even went back and played Doom 20 2016 a uh, year ago. It was gifted to me by uh, uh Hero X Hero and I you know, I, I enjoyed it just as much on the PC as I did on the Switch and on the PlayStation. Um so yeah, I, I really hope that they are telling the truth with this and it's gonna be um just a, a great experience. I mean, personally, Doom 2016's multiplayer, I played it a little bit. I got the Platinum Trophy, and I was like, okay, I don't need to play multiplayer anymore. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Mario World has racked up 2 million downloads in its first 27 hours, and it's already banked $100,000 in microtransactions. So... Last week, Nintendo released its fifth mobile game, Dr. Mario World, and the game is kind of like a backwards Dr. Mario game. You have to, like, take the capsules and move them upwards into position. It's fairly easy, and it does get a little bit harder as you go on, but I feel like the amount of, of difficulty in, in the puzzles is very low. But, um... Right now, it's selling better in the first 72 hours than Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, which sold six, which had 6 million downloads, Fire Emblem, Emblem Heroes, which had 4.9 million, Super Mario Run, which had 4 million, uh, and um, it, it's beaten them by a long, a, a long shot. So, what is going to happen now that the player base is there and they're 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 apparently selling microtransactions to this i played just a smidge of dr mario world it's not really a game that i felt enjoy you know i didn't feel joy playing it i thought it was a very basic experience um and i i saw that there was a microtransaction component there's little hearts that you can buy so they can keep playing if you with you lose a few times over and over again i don't i didn't really i didn't buy any of them because i kept beating the levels because they were so freaking easy like I, i've gotten like 
15, 20 levels in, and I'm like, geez, this is like getting easier as it goes on. And the fact that you can you can move the pill to wherever you want, and then once the pill breaks apart, you can move the piece to the pill. It's like, where's the challenge in this? And all the up, you know, like the little things that are in there, like the Koopa shells and stuff like that. I don't know, man. Maybe I'm just too good at the game. Uh, Nintendo also put out a Dr. Mario World wallpaper for PC and smartphone in North America. If you go to the Nintendo um, eShop, you can get a Dr. Mario World uh, background for about 50 platinum coins. There's one that has all different characters on it, and there's also one that just has Dr. Mario with a few viruses and a nice little pill background to it. Uh, Dr. Mario has also put out its first patch, version 1.0.0.3, jeezish, uh, and it improved the balance of the game and fixed some bugs. Alright, this is a little sexual. There's a new erotic horror uh, game called Lust for Darkness, and it might be the most risque game on the Switch, and it is only for the Switch! <laughs> This isn't the typical game that you would see on the eShop, and it's certainly one that your grandmother would not would would not want to play. Uh, it's going to be available to download. Uh, it's actually available to download now, and it's for about fifteen dollars on the eShop. The trailer cannot be shown on the podcast because it has some boobies in it and some bare buttocks. Uh, but it's it's a very creepy looking game because as soon as you see those sexual images, everything turns into like horror for a second, then it turns back. So the game is um, is like a psycho psychological thriller almost. Some the the here's here's what the game description reads as: Jonathan Moon receives a letter from his wife who has gone missing a year before. Following information from her message, he heads to the secluded mansion where an eldritch occult ceremony is taking place. The game features erotic and occult themes, world design inspired with works of Lovecraft, Geiger, and Zzzzu Bekiksky. I don't know who those other two are. Exploring a Victorian mansion and a world of Luska. Using portals to transverse between two alternative realities, searching for hidden items to unlock side stories, find out more about the game's backstory, escaping the creatures of Luska. Original soundtrack by known composer Draco Nared. The Nintendo eShop listing notes that the game may contain content not appropriate for all ages or may not be appropriate for viewing at work with nudity, sexual content, frequent violence, and gore all mentioned. Like I said, it's about $15 on the eShop. Um, I don't know if you're going to pop a banner while uh, playing this game, um, but it is it is an interesting thing to see on the Switch. You know, the, the, the most risque thing on the Switch right now is like that daddy dating simulator. <laughs> so... Check this out if you want to. Um, if you want to, definitely look at the trailer first. Um, you know, this this one might not be for, for, for everyone. <laughs> um, Platinum Games Astral Chain has revealed its file size and a few other details with its, um, with its pre-order available now. So the upcoming action game Astral Chain is going to be about 9.6 gigabytes of space on the Switch. And it also, the listing confirmed that the game will support all three of the Switch's gameplay modes. So TV, tabletop, and handheld. And it's going to be playable on the Switch Lite. And it also supports one to two players. And Pro Controller is supported. And also Japanese, English, Spanish, French, German, Italian, Russian, Korean, and Chinese languages are going to be available. Right now, the listing notes that save data cloud support is pending. So it's not available right now, supposedly, but I'm sure by the time the game comes out, the game is, you know, you'll be able to use the cloud saves for sure. I'm probably going to be buying this one. Uh, like I said in the E3 conversation, this game, every time they reveal something new about the game, even though it's like in that Japanese anime style and I don't entirely enjoy that style of video games, it looks better and better every time I every time I see something come out about it. So I'm definitely interested in this one and probably going to be picking up when it comes out, which is the 30th of August. All right, speaking of uh, your grandma, she's finally beat Zelda Twilight Princess after 755 hours uh, of total playtime. So, the Reddit user Mellershrius shared images and background info which tell the story of his grandmother's time with... I'm sorry, with Zelda Twilight Princess. After a whopping 750 hours, she managed to beat the final boss and complete the game. Chris, who is the Reddit user, says he's incredibly proud of his grandmother, and she absolutely loves Zelda. The Reddit post has gone viral and received up to 65,000 upvotes at the time of this article's release. 
messages of admiration, support, and goodwill, and even a marriage proposal pouring in from other gaming fans. You can check it all out yourself on the in Reddit, and you can also see his posts on uh, Imager uh, of all his conversations with his grandmother while she was playing the game. The first t- text message she sent to him about the game says, Hey, just had to tell you I finally started making progress with Twilight Princess. Between internet walkthroughs and YouTube videos and a book I bought years ago, I feel like I might make it to the end. And he responded with, That's awesome. It's just a great game. Definitely let me know if you end up beating it. She says she beat the game. She supposed she would give an award for the longest time ever uh, from Nintendo. Or she would get an award for the longest time ever to beat a game from Nintendo. She hasn't stopped laughing. When she swung the sword for the ending blow and the bad guy died, sort of, at least for now, it only took about 755 hours. I got to. It's got to be a record. And uh, Chris replied with, wow, that's incredible. You, you did it in no time at all. <laughs> I'm glad I could have helped along the way. Feel free to send me a photo of the time played. So she did, and that's when he posted it to the interwebs. Congratulations to this gaming grandma. If you don't recall, uh, the gaming grandma from Animal Crossing also made news uh, with her massive amounts of hours in Animal Crossing. Um, so pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, interesting news. An ultra-rare Pokemon card sold for $60,000 and got lost in the mail. (laughs) The eBay seller had a trainer number three card in their position, which was only given out to the third-place winner of a specific 1999 Pokemon competition in Japan. And as you can imagine, this is one of the rarest cards to ever be released. Uh, And last year, someone bought it for $60,000. The card was sent using the United States Postal Service... All right, and was insured for $50,000. So this person isn't losing too much money compared to what he bought it for. It was delivered with an assortment of other items, but never arrived at the destination. And speaking to Polygon, Pokemon Place said, My responsibility was to ship the card to the buyer, a middleman company that then ships the card to the buyer. The tracking information I have was with registered mail and shows tracking and a signature. RMX claims they hadn't received and signed in. Haven't received it and signed it for a bulk lot. He also says that um, the lot was signed for. They cannot claim the insurance for the missing card. Oh, no. The whole event seems highly suspicious, but according to Pokemon's TCG expert, um, both uh, the buyer and the seller did everything they could to make the transaction work smoothly. He also believes that the Postal Service are completely to blame, and the theor- and he theorizes that someone may have stolen the card after finding out its value, which I would believe so as well. If a mail worker... not Maybe it's not... I'm not going to blame the Post Office um, for stealing the card, but I will blame them for probably delivering it to the wrong place. Someone opened it up going, oh, what's this? And they see a Pokemon card, and they're like, hmm. And they see on the on the, probably a slip, oh, $60,000, and they probably are going to go ahead and resell it guaranteed, or they'll keep it for a while and then sell it later on in life. But this sucks for this person because apparently this is a, like the most rare card ever. And they were like, they finally got their hands on it. They finally won the bidding on it, maybe. And when they, they just didn't get it in the mail. That's, it's pretty crazy and kind of shitty. So a little bit of news for the Nintendo Switch Lite. Uh, Nintendo has no plans to add the Switch Lite's D-pad to future Joy-Con configurations. Doug Bowser came out uh, with an, in an interview with CNET and said that there are no plans or nothing to announce yet in terms of further variations of the Joy-Con. Uh, as you know, a lot of people complain about the D-pad buttons for the original the original Switch uh, Joy-Cons, and they updated it to a D-pad uh, for the Switch Lite. Now, I personally have never really found a problem with the D button, the buttons, but I can see where people would want that more classic feel with a D-pad, and and having them add it to the Switch Lite only proves that they have the technology and they have the you know the the, the know-how to know to put this on the the Lite, so maybe it'll sell better. But I feel like they really should put out an updated version of the Switch Joy-Con. They would make tons of money. Lots of people are disappointed with the D-pad, but yeah, you know, who am I? Just a person on the internet. So as of right now, Super Mario Maker 2 players have already uploaded more than 2 million courses and the game isn't even a month old. On Twitter, Nintendo of America came out and said, Thanks to all the Super Mario Maker 2 players who have reached 2 million courses uploaded. We hope everyone continues to create and share their dream courses. Um, in this time frame, we've seen about, uh, we've seen Zelda theme levels, a full 32 course game, developers from other companies making their own stages, YouTubers creating their own stages and putting them out there. There's also been a stage for getting over it. Someone actually recreated the entire getting over it layout, (laughs) which is kind of funny. 
Um, so yeah, if you want to, you can also check out my courses. If you go to my Twitter or my Discord, there are posts um, showing my course levels. They're not that hard, and they're very cheesable because I'm so bad at the game. Uh, but they are. it's kind of fun to see your favorite creators make some levels, and you get to check them out, play them, and do whatever you want with them. So, speaking of Kickstarters, Chicken Wiggle Workshop is unlikely to be released on Switch this year. This is a Kickstarter campaign that... Um, was funded and the developer thought it was going to be out in 2019 and they came out and said in an update saying we don't know exactly how much more time it will take other than this game won't likely hit until uh it won't it won't likely hit the 2019 release window like we hoped we don't want to put any more undue expectations on anyone and as soon as we have news and on an exact release date we will let you know the reason for the delay is to do with expanding the overall scope of the project we originally expected chicken wiggle workshop Whew, that's a weird name to be completed by now hence our original expected date as we started to put things together we quickly realized that just a new paint job on wiggle wasn't the right approach to this game we decided to expand the scope of the project by including the planned stretch goals into development to better suit our fans and overall game experience. In doing this, so, the project is taking longer than expected, and we stumbled into some development issues which pushed back the launch window. Please understand, we are a very small team. We never want to let any of you down. We failed in meeting your expectations, and we are very sorry, and we hope you understand, and we're doing our best. We apologize for being radio silent. However, we thought it wasn't good to keep saying we have no news at this time, but perhaps that might have been better than saying nothing at all. Moving forward, the game plans to try to work on more frequent updates, even if it's bad news. We understand a delay is never what anyone wants to hear, but we ask that you weather the storm with us just a bit longer. We also know a rush game is a bad game, and we feel everyone deserves their very best. I'm okay with this. Once again, I know I'm not someone who put money into this game, but... If you want an un an incomplete game and uh, you know you're you're ready for to for some backlash, yeah, sure, release it unfinished. Who cares, right? <laughs> A lot of people care. Ukulele, Anthem, No Man's Sky, Fallout 76, all perfect examples of them releasing, rushing, and putting out a game that wasn't ready yet. And this other Kickstarter, who's a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, there's a little chicken with a worm in his backpack, a la Banjo Kazooie esque. They need a little bit more time with that, and I'm okay with that. Take your time. The develop the publisher and developer is a Tui, and it's going to be an action platformer, single player only. The 3DS uh, release date was the 17th of August 2017. The new release date has not been uh, officially revealed yet, as I said. Uh, you can also see the official blog post on atui.com. The title is Chicken Wiggle, and it looks kind of interesting. <laughs> All right, Tropico 6 has a release date finally confirmed for PS4. It's going to be coming in, 29, uh, in 2019, um, and it's been pushed back to the 27th of September, which isn't too far away. Um, this game has already been available for, on PC for months, and it's finally going to be available on PS4 in the near future. I know there, I know there's a few people who I follow who are fans of Tropico. Um, I think the fifth one was free on PlayStation Plus not too long ago. Uh, probably to get some hype generated for Tropico 6. Uh, they had to push the game back a little bit, and now it's finally going to be arriving. Um, I've never played a Tropico game. I think I played a little bit of 4 uh, just to see how it was. It was I think that was another one that was free for PlayStation Plus back in the, back in the day. Uh, so I don't have too many opinions about Tropico 6, but the people who are ready or who, are, who want this game, now you have a release date, and it's confirmed so far, but who knows if they'll have to push it back again. <laughs> All right, so there's been some gods and monsters details emerging as the Assassin's Creed Odyssey devs talk about the next open world title. If you don't remember, gods and monsters had a little trailer at E3. It showed off that it's going to be a more of a cartoony style set in those times of mythical beasts. And I'm not talking about the Rhett and Link, good mythical morning. So um, the game is due to launch on PlayStation 4 on the 25th of February 2020. And uh, everyone's kind of excited for this game. And I am too. It looks kind of interesting, but we haven't seen a lot about it. So the the senior producer, Mark Alexis Quote, has taken to the publisher's official blog to talk about the game. So here's essentially what he talks about. Inspiration for Gods and Monsters came from working on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The team wanted to further explore geek Greek mythology without the limits of an Assassin's Creed game. Dr. Stephanie Ann Ruta the historian who guided the team on Assassin's Creed Odyssey also happens to be an expert on Greek mythology, so the developer is making use of her skills once again. 
Gods and Monsters has a more lighthearted approach in storytelling. The narrative unfolds as a legendary Greek author, Homer, recounts the tale to his grandchildren. Huh, that's kind of cool. Combat is fast-paced and ability-based. Main character, Phoenix. Phoenix, yeah. Phoenix will need to make use of abilities to defeat enemies as well as traverse the environments. Uh, Typhoon is the central villain, a particularly powerful monster who Zeus banished to the underworld. Phoenix's sex and appearance can be customized. There's also talk of armor and gear, although it's unclear whether gods and monsters will have some kind of loot system similar to Odyssey. Finally, Phoenix's stats can be also be customized, so it would seem that some light RPG mechanics are going to be in gods and monsters. This is some cool information. I'm glad that they came out and told a little bit more about the game since the trailer was very vague. It just showed a character with a sword and a helmet going up against three harpy ladies. <laughs> so hopefully we'll see more about this game in the near future. All right, so Shenmue 3 backers are irate as pre-order bonuses are not included for them and the season pass is also going to be sold separately. Um, it looks like Shenmue 3 is going to be finished, a uh, finished product by the end of the year and this is cause for celebration, but unfortunately the long-awaited sequel has been in the headlines for the wrong reasons, mostly due to developer Wise Net accepting a window of timed exclusivity for Epic Games store release. None of the drama really affects the PlayStation 4 edition, but one thing that will um, that will are the lack of pre-order bonuses for Kickstarter backers. If you are pre-ordering the game through participating retailer outlets, you'll be guaranteed the uh, the outfits and the advanced technique scroll and the pecking power starter pack. Well, um, we're assuming these items are going to be unlockable using in-game currency. Some funders feel they're being ripped off. Writing on the project's Kickstarter start on the Kickstarter page, a representative for Wise Net pointed out that the backers will get the crowd-funded version of the game, which comes with its own roster of exclusive bonuses unavailable elsewhere. This has done little to to douse the backlash fires. To make matters worth, the developers also confirmed that those who donated to the title will have to buy its season pass separately, prompting further outrage. Personally, we're not sure that the fun why the fundos feel entitled to everything, especially those who contribute less than $30 for a full copy of the game. Then again, why Nets should be bending over backwards for its fans. Uh, and right now, it doesn't feel that way. So, I guess people are outraged because they're not getting some special incentives. Um, I think that there should have been a Kickstarter point, like, at $60, you get everything season pass dlc stuff like that i get that there's exclusive dlc like day one dlc the places as usual but it's kind of weird that so many people are getting outraged about this but i mean if you spend money on something like this of course you're gonna have some slight opinions about the subject matter so greedfall has got a official release trailer and release date announced september 10th is when the game is going to be coming the trailer is freaking amazing. Go watch that shit right now if you have not seen it. It looks like a great mix between open world, Bloodborne type gameplay, maybe a little bit of Witcher in there, maybe a little bit of RPG elements. And um, it's going to be coming out on the 10th of September. And it's going to be developed by Spider Studio. The publisher is Focus Home Interactive. And it's, a, it's, it's in the genre of RPG, but it has a lot of Souls-like stuff to it as well, it looks like. So it seems like the quest is going to be... Uh, Stopping an unstoppable plague, and it's gonna be you're you're gonna join your cousin, Governor Constant Constant de Ose, along with various factions with their own directives and hidden agendas. You journey into the new world, steeping with magic. Will you align yourself with one of the new colonies or join the natives in their struggle for liberty? So it looks really interesting. The design and quality of it looks pretty good. Um, I'm I'm excited for this game, and I want it now. <laughs> I'm willing to wait. But I want it now. <laughs> I want it now. All right, so Call of Duty Modern Warfare multiplayer is going to be shown off the 1st of August. On Twitter, Call of Duty came out saying the new generation of Call of Duty multiplayer is coming. Mark your calendar for the global reveal of Modern Warfare on August 1st. So, yeah, we'll see what this all entails. They said the multiplayer universe, so I'm not sure what that exactly means, but... Hey, we'll see if it looks anything like the original Modern Warfare or maybe Modern Warfare 2. Who knows? I'm sure they're going to be showing off some new guns, probably some new perks or something like that to go along with the game. Obviously, they're going to want to show off the graphical quality. I'm hoping that they're going to show off some single-player stuff as well because I'm more interested in that personally. But eh, we'll have to wait and see. Motto of the podcast, y'all. All right, so The Division 2 has dated its first DLC episode and fans are not too happy. Division 2 has dated its first post-launch DLC episode named Ex Expeditions. 
Um, it's going to come out uh, in 2019 on the 23rd of July in a couple of weeks. It brings update 5, which includes new exotic weapons, flashlights, gear balancing, and even more crafting options and skill builds, as well as the controversial difficult raid, o Operation Dark Hours, is going to receive a new, easier difficulty mode as part of the patch 2, titled Discovery Difficulty. It's here where things get a little fishy, though. Year 1 pass owners will receive all narrative content, two new main missions, a week early. Alongside that, two further classified assignments arrive completely exclusive to those of the optional add-on. Sounds fair enough, but remember, every piece of story content can be played by all players eventually. Division 2 came out on Twitter and said, Save the date! Episode 1 releases on July 23rd, and Year 1 pass holders will have exclusive access to new narrative content for one week. All balancing tweaks and bug fixes will go live for all players on the 23rd as well. Uh, the problem seems to be that the missions and content have been available on the PC test servers since the beginning of July for free. It has led PS4 players and Xbox players to question the point of the year one pass they purchased when the game first launched. People have come out on Twitter and responded to this post just bashing them over and over and over again about the quality of the game, the bugs in the game, etc., etc., Everyone's hoping that this is going to fix the game, but I guarantee it's not going to because they put out multiple patches before this, uh, trying to fix AI issues, balancing issues, stuff like that. It just doesn't seem to work. People have also come out on Twitter saying that the um, the raid is just so difficult. They've grinded for hours and hours on end, and now they're putting out a baby mode. What the fuck? <laughs> but... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that uh, this update's going to do something to the game, whether it's going to make it better or worse... Uh, that's, uh, only time will tell. <laughs> Me personally, haven't played the Division 2 in a while, so I'm out of the loop on that. Alright, so real quickly, let's open up a Call, um, a Call of Duty, a Yu-Gi-Oh! booster pack. We're still opening up the Arena of Lost Souls booster packs. The official ep um, episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! Rebuilding My Deck has, of course, come out on the channel this uh, last Tuesday, and I opened up a whole box of of these packs trying to find we're still trying to find that legendary uh, blue eyes fusion card which has been eluding us for some time but we're making progress we're making progress all right what we got uh the shallow grave a great mammoth of gold fine I have so many of these i don't i don't need any more magicians unite wah, wah, hate those and armored zombie okay nothing real good here I think all the packs we've opened from this newest pack that I bought have been complete shite. We have one more pack in this bundle of four that come four comes in each pack. So we'll see uh, we'll see if we get anything better in the near future. All right, uh, thank you so much for coming to this episode of Yemicast, a video game podcast. It's a pleasure having you here, and if you're talking in the, the premiere, I appreciate you as well. I hope you guys like the new background. I added some nice uh, animals for you to look at. There's a hippo over there, a horse, a kangaroo. Uh, there's a sloth right there that you can't really see. There you go. There's a sloth right there. Uh, there's a few things behind my chair as well. Uh, just thought I'd liven up the place a little bit, you know? Get a little change in there. Anyways... Thank you so much for coming. Remember, uh, weekend stream has been canceled, but Thursday's stream is still a go. Still a go. So tomorrow's stream is still a go if you're listening to this on Wednesday the 17th. Anyways, I am your host, Yemi the Ferret, and this has been another episode of YemiCast, a video game podcast.